It's not every day that a new Ferrari model arrives in the showroom. Granted, the company's push into limited run variants and new categories means it's sending more new metal out the door than in the past, but at its core, the brand still focuses on four categories. Front-engined V12 supercars like the 812 Superfast, front-engined four-seat Gran Turismo like the GTC4 Lusso, and the don't call it an SUV, Pura Sange that's replacing it, front-engine. For many, the latter is the first thing that comes to mind when they think of a Ferrari. Since the 308 GTB first hit the streets in 1975, they've been the tip of the spear for the line, less expensive than the 12-cylinder supercars, but also edgier and more relatable to legions of fans who aspired to F-car ownership or were just getting the first taste of the brand. Furthermore, nothing says supercar like a mid-engined design, and only a few automakers have mastered it like Ferrari. After more than four decades of these mid-mounted, eight-hot-powered models serving as one of the pillars of Marinello's Parthenon, a major change in the land of mid-engine Ferraris arrived in 2022. The 296 GTB Coupe and the 296 GTS Roadster have the wild looks and specs one would expect from such a machine, but the contents of the engine bay are quite different. So what makes the Ferrari 296 GTS special? It's a Ferrari, so that makes it pretty special right away. More than that, it's a mid-engined Ferrari, the latest in a long line of vehicles that have helped define the brand. Even by F-Car standards, the 296 GTS and its hardtop twin, the 296 GTB, are quite unique. The 296 is only the second production Ferrari in history to offer a plug-in hybrid powertrain following the all-wheel drive V8 FEV SF90 speed machine unveiled three years ago. The electrified end of the system, which combines a low-mounted 7.45 kW lithium-ion battery and a rear-mounted 224-horsepower electric motor, can both enable 15 miles of silent running at speeds of up to 83 miles per hour and boost the power and responses of the internal combustion heart. Now, what's it like to drive the 296 GTS? To properly express how the 296 feels behind the wheel, you may need to invent some new swear words. With more horsepower than a Dodge Challenger Red Eye and a curb weight of around 3,600 pounds, one literal 800 pound gorilla, than said Dodge, the 296 GTS should be nearly uncontrollable, at least by morals. The Ferrari's engineers are the automotive equivalent of Nidavolo's dwarves. They create weapons that not only defy physics, but turn people into gods simply by touching them. To unleash full Thor power, set the Manatino dial on the steering wheel, which controls the whip smart stability control systems to race or CT. Off set the E Manatino in charge of the powertrain settings to qualify and engage manual shifting by clicking the right paddle. The first move loosens the computer's reins just enough to allow for some fun, but not enough to ruin the party. The second unleashes full power from the powertrain, and the third immerses you completely in the experience. The 8-speed dual-clutch gearbox is intelligent enough to make its own decisions, but unless you're racing, it's far more fun to use the giant carbon fiber paddles to shift through the gears. Step on the gas and the power arrives like a miracle. There's no slipping or spinning, no sense of the car struggling to control all that energy, it just goes faster than common sense would suggest. It's difficult to believe any car can put this much power down through two wheels on street tires. Sure, I've had that thought after driving Ferrari's 812 and F8, but it still surprises me every time. The combination of the electric motor, twin turbos and the 8500 RPM redline gives this powertrain a feeling unlike any other. Almost instantaneous response at almost any engine speed with acceleration that just keeps on giving and giving as revs rise and the power keeps on coming. The off-the-line performance is as insane as you'd expect. Ferrari's claimed 2.9 second 0 to 62 miles per hour time feels very achievable, but it's almost more astonishing to drop the box down a gear or two, then slam the gas at speed, where the full tractability of the power system can be revealed and the V6's engine note with its cry can be savored. And the fun continues when the turns arrive. The short radio steering rack is designed for narrow, winding roads. You'll rarely need to shuffle your hands around for a better grip because you can make almost every turn with your mitts still at 9 and 3. 
There's a lot of feedback and information coming through the wheel, which is good because with the amount of speed it can carry through any curves in the road, you'll want to know that everything you can and react quickly if necessary. Bush do hard through a turn, however, and the result is surprisingly gentle oversteer. A bit of opposite lock brings it back into line and leaves you giggling at the prospect of catching slides in a rear-wheel drive car that approaches the potency of the original Bugatti Veyron. There are faster cars on the track, but there aren't many that can compete with the 296 on the street and even fewer that make the drive feel as engaging. It's a drug. Plain and simple, one you crave before and after you use it. Under normal circumstances, there is no physical connection between the pedal and the pads. Instead, a computer and some wires tell the brakes how much to activate based on how hard you press the left pedal. But you'd never guess it from the way they feel. It's as natural as a traditional mechanical system. It's difficult not to wonder if Ferrari's engineers got some Lockheed Martin engineers drunk and picked their brains about how they make fly-by-wire work on fighter jets. While the E-Manatino has four modes in total E-Drive, Hybrid, Performance and Qualify, you really only need to be concerned with number two and four. Unless you really poke the throttle hard in Hybrid, the car defaults to electric drive, so unless you're creeping home and absolutely need to guarantee that you won't wake your parents up, there is little need for E-Drive. And in the name of battery efficiency, performance mode limits a portion of the system's total output, whereas Qualify gives you the full welly of 819 horses. For what it's worth, an hour of fast driving in Qualify was enough to fully recharge an almost empty battery. So how does the 296 GDS feel on the inside? While the powertrain is revolutionary for Maranello series production car, the interior is much more familiar to anyone who has sampled the brand's other cars, particularly the newest models like the Roma, where screens and touch-sensitive electric pads have replaced physical displays and control in most cases. The cabin is stylish and driver-focused, with elegant flowing lines and everything in its place. The 296 GDS is strictly a two-seater. Any bags, gear, or other accoutrements that are too large to fit beneath your passenger's legs must be dropped into the front, which is large enough to hold a couple good-sized backpacks or small to mid-sized carry-on bags. However, there is a large cup holder, so there's no need to give up your sizable iced coffee habit in the name of Ferrari Life. It feels like it's on the edge of a driver's parameters the car was designed for, just like most Ferraris and fast Italian cars. Legroom is limited, even with the seat as far as back as possible, your knees will remain bent in the entire time. The sharp-looking racing seats in a car equipped with a track-focused Assetto Fiorano package offered a bit more legroom while remaining comfortable overall. The all-glass instrument panel, which enables the driver to cycle audio, navigation and car data through small, medium and large viewing slots on both sides of the tachometer, which defaults to a digital recreation of the analog gauge that has defined the view of Ferrari drivers for decades, handles infotainment duties. There is also a full-screen mode that expands the navigation to fill the entire instrument panel, as well as a racing mode with a more modern track-focused layout, but anything other than the traditional center-mounted tack feels heretical. Thankfully, the steering wheel still has some physical controls like shift paddles, volume and tuning buttons, turn signals and wiper controls. However, fiddling with the navigation, radio or anything else on that central screen necessitates the use of a trackpad and associated capacitive buttons on the wheel's 3 o'clock spoke. Once you get used to it, it's a fairly intuitive system, it reacts quickly and precisely, and having it right below the screen in your eyeliner makes it feel more efficient but it would still be easier to use if it were controlled by hard buttons rather than a touch-sensitive pad. Alright guys, this wraps up our video for today. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. Please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on other upcoming videos. Bye for now.